so for the first question, it seems that 78% of you have gone for A, and that is indeed the correct answer. So what should you be able to, well, first of all, you should be very suspicious of what's going on here. Um, this is a 19 year old who's coming with abdominal pain vomiting um, and is drowsy with low sugar. So you're thinking this is DKA. So already you know that this is ketosis, so adding acid to the system. So that should give you an indication that this will always be a raised anion gap metabolic acid process. Now the anion gap is an easy calculation that you can make at the bedside when you're seeing patients in AE to determine the likely cause of someone's acidosis. So if it's normal, then you're thinking it's probably through the loss of bicarbonate, if it's a normal anion gap. So that could be through renal or gastrointestinal routes. But if it's a raised anion gap acidosis, then realistically the cause is you can compile it either from endotoxins or from exogenous toxins. And so there are on the right of here common, uh, common mnemonics of how to, uh, of things to remember in that context. Now the common ones that you remember are lactate. Um, I would um, remind you that there are two different types of lactate, both of which can cause high um, anion gap acidosis, and it's the L-lactate that we measure, for instance, for sepsis. But your D-lactate is very important um, in particularly small bowel syndrome, so or short bowel syndrome, so people with malabsorption issues. And the leading causes then are kind of things such as um, obviously methanol, aspirin, and glycols, and things like that. So you should know a little bit about how they present. Um, so for instance, with crushing renal failure. So in terms of DKA, obviously um, type 1 diabetes, this is what we're thinking, DKA, and around 4% of patients um, will initially present in DKA from their, di from their diabetes. Um, and this is one of those things that you don't want to miss um, because early management um, and effective management is very important in outcomes, particularly in children, um, where if they're not treated, they can have massive issues such for instance, cerebral edema and possible death. Now, the criteria for you to pick up DKA will be on the basis of the pH. So it has to be acidotic, so less than 7.5. It has to be with raised ketones, and we say over three for that, and a low bicarbonate, which is obviously uh, reflecting the acidemia that is uh, occurring. Now, in terms of precipitating events, the most common kind of things are infection, um, but, also, but also through COVID times, I saw quite a lot of instances of insulin um, being um, not taken, um, and that was a cause for DKA. Obviously, it can be the initial presentation, but don't forget things such as strokes and MI can really present as initial DKA. Um, now, in clinical signs, obviously, what you may see is the respiratory alkalosis that develops uh, to try and combat this, um, and eventually it can lead to a cat's mouth breathing, which is obviously a very severe sign for this. And bedside tests are the most important. So, you know, you can always do a blood sugar. You want to try and do plasma ketones instead of urinary ketones because there can be a delay in the excretion of ketones in the urine. So you could get false assurance. And remember the effects of high blood sugars can have on sodium in that it can cause what we call a pseudo hyponatremia um, or an artifactually high um, uh, sodium because, because of the high sugar, you're getting more excretion of water, which means you can concentrate your sodium load. Now, in terms of the aims of treatment, well, I think we should all know that you try to treat the underlying cause, um, but also you want to start them on insulin, which is usually kind of 0.1 units per kilo per hour. And you want to do regular BBGs in order to see the, uh, and assess the benefits of that. And you will give them a generative fluids, which you kind of give it one, two or four liters, uh, one or two, four hourly. But um, the aims of the treatment are you want to decrease the ketones, and that's in the yellow box by kind of 0.5 millimoles per hour, increase the bicarbonate by three millimoles per, per liter per hour, and decrease the glucose by three. So, and if you're not reaching those targets, then you need to, in, you need to change the actual insulin um, that is being used, so the actual rate. Um, and something that is often, I think, juniors forget is that um, the aim is not necessarily to normalize the sugar, it's there to normalize the ketone. So if somebody's got a normal blood sugar, but the ketones are still high, you want to persist with a fixed rate um, infusion of insulin to resolve the ketosis first, um, rather than um, 
rather than just stopping treatment. And of course, when the sugars are low, then you will replace with um, dextrose. So this is just some excerpts from the kind of diabetes guidelines and things about the fluid choice. So the lower picture there on the left, you can see how you should give your initial treatment. So predominantly it's about giving saline with potassium, but that depends on what the initial potassium is. Um, generally with these patients when they come to DK, it'll normally be 3.5 to 5.5. They very rarely will be raised. Um, it, it can be, and in those patients where it's over 5.5, you would hold the potassium in all bags. Um, and as I said, you'd be doing those four hourly kind of, uh, well, hourly VDGs initially, moving to two or four hourly um, following the kind of fluid recess. Now, um, in terms of other treatments that are also used, um, you want to, or you may use, I may have heard about using things such as IV phosphate and IV dicarbonate, but that's realistically not going to be given just by yourself. That would be done in conjunction with ITU because we use the bicarbonate when there's very severe acidosis, um, particularly if it's kind of less than 7.1, we're trying to do that because that can have further kind of impingement on the electrolytes. But the key things with these patients is you don't just see them once, prescribe the fluids and go and just come back. You need to constantly reassess these patients. Now, when you resolve the DKA, we, we consider that when the beam is pH is over 7.35, so back to normal, and the ketones are now undetectable. So we would say kind of less than uh, 0.5. Now, what you do then is obviously you want to start them on insulin because that's what's going to prevent the next if this is the initial uh, presentation. And a simple way to do that is to just take the weight of the patient and then you multiply it by 0.5 and that will give you the 24 hour um, insulin requirements. So, um, you know, if they're 70 kilos and then you know, times by 0.5, you get 35. And then you would want to split that so that you get three doses, which will be your kind of fast acting. And then you will give two thirds of it as your uh, long acting, which you get again. All right. So that is DKA in a nutshell. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, so it seems that about 60% of you want to give atropine. And then the most common one then is some transcutaneous pacing. Okay, so when we read this question, I think it gives a very good idea. You know, you're going to deal with syncope on a daily basis in your clinical practice, and you'll have to work out is this vasovagal, is it seizures, is it cardiogenic? And he gives very, you know, even before you read about the ECG and the slip, the fact that he initially went pale and then appears flushed. A very good sign for cardiac syncope, and that's just because you initially go hypoxic, and then because of the um, hypercapnia that develops, you get visibility, and then you get this flushed appearance thereafter. And he was walking around, so yeah, that's particularly good. So, this it might be reminiscent of a kind of Stokes Adam attack, so going into intermittent heart block leading to this kind of uh, this kind of issue. And then it goes on to say that there's complete dissociation between the P wave and the QRS. So, this is we think this is you know third degree heart block this is the worry so for those who said then the right answer is indeed IV atropine now when you see these patients it's about what to do next apart from just being a little bit scared um I remember seeing someone like this as an F1 
um, and they were on their own in the cubicle. So it's about just taking things gently uh, and thinking. So always fall back on your A3 approach. I think um, nobody's going to look at you and ask you to fix everything to know what to do. That's why you have senior. So you can do an A3 and you can think of is this person and well, what do they, you know, do they need more senior support? Um, so here, um, obviously, this is from the kind of ALS guidelines, but it's an excellent benchmark of what you should be doing. So A3 approach, monitor. Now, when you see somebody's got bradycardic, so that just means less than 60 beats per minute, as you know, the key thing is looking for any adverse features. And particularly, we're looking for kind of shock, syncope, ischemia, heart failure. So they will come in saying, I've got crushing chest pain when they're bradycardic. Now, that could obviously be from two things. The crushing chest pain could be, obviously, the coronary perfusion comes from the heartbeat, um, as it, you know, obviously, as it ejects from the left ventricle. But also it could be the bradycardia could be secondary to, for instance, an MI, uh, an inferior MI, which is affecting sinus node, hence they go into a bradycardia. Now, if they have any signs of shock or any of those features, heart failure or whatever not, you want to give them atropine straight away to try and correct this. Now, atropine is from deadly nightshade and works by blocking muscarinic receptors, but it doesn't work for long, probably about half an hour or so. So it's a reversible thing. So it's going to cause um kind of a reflex um tachycardia or at least will normalize the heartbeat and will buy you some time now if there's responsiveness to that um it's whilst you're trying to obviously correct the other things and obviously gain them uh, support you could continue giving up to kind of six sources so three you know three milligrams in total is given but if you are seeing that um you know the response is poor and it's not working and actually there's worrying signs excuse me, that's when you want to think about giving other therapies. So you will see here, they mentioned, for instance, using isoprenaline. Isoprenaline works on beta-1 and beta-2 receptors, so it causes um, increased heart rate particularly, um, but will cause vasodilation of arterial. But when you, you know, you're not going to be starting adrenaline yourself, but transcutaneous facing is something that you'll be trained to do as ALS, so that's uh, a good idea to use. Now, for pacing, the whole point of transcutaneous pacing is that you're trying to deliver a rhythm to the uh, electrical impulse to the heart, which will generate into a mechanical contraction. And the picture above just shows that on a normal um, defibrillator, you have the ability to do that. So you just put the pads on the chest. And then what you want to do is increase the current to the point um, in milliamps to where you get little um, waves. So you might see on the ECG that there are spikes going up. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the, uh, maybe you can. But there's these little spikes going up and then you see the deep QRS. So that is an impulse. So that is the impulse that you were giving to the pacing. And you can say that this is capturing or having an effect because it's leading to an actual QRS. So the atrial impulse that you're giving is leading to a QRS or ventricular conduction and then what you want to do is confirm that with an actual palpation of uh, the carotid beat to make sure that there is mechanical capture i.e that this electrical capture is leading to an actual contraction of the heart and then when you reach that threshold in terms of the current you want to go just a little bit extra and that buys you time now the problem with this is that this is quite painful when you're doing it so you want to give them um some sedation beforehand so this is why whilst you're giving your atropine you want to try and call the senior support call your kind of uh, anaesthetist and your you know, registrar and things like that and so this can be planned because we want to try and do this plan whilst the cardiologist is sorting this out and obviously further interventions are being planned so yeah well done let's move on to the next one oh it's better with head try with headphones it's okay oh god um do you want me on headphones or is this okay someone reply <laughs> it's okay okay yeah Okay. 
I'm just going to stay like this so it seems people are in between about the headphones now. But I'm happy to read to them hands. So. Okay, so it seems three quarters, thereabouts have gone for D, vagal maneuvers. Some of you wanted DC cardiovert, some of you want veripamil, and some of you want adenosine. Okay, so in this one, you've seen somebody, um, she got poorly controlled asthma. Okay, so she, we can probably see why she might have gone into this. She might have just, um, oh, I've just clicked on, but basically, yeah, you could see possibly why she might go into uh, into this rhythm. So she's gone regular narrow complex tachycardia. So that should already alert you to things. It's not a regular, um, it's not broad complex. So we're not thinking of any VT. You know, we're not thinking of any bundle branch block. Um, so we're thinking this is fast. So this could be an atrial tachycardia. This could be a supraventricular tachycardia. Is what we're thinking now. Notice we haven't said anything about the blood pressure, and that's deliberately to make you think. So for those people who thought DC cardioversion, if I said that the blood pressure was 60 over 40, then the first line thing I would be doing is definitely cardioversion this patient, which I've done and is scary. Um, and But if it was just normal, so they're normal tenses, so it's 150, so you know, the blood pressure is still um, 150 over 60. 120, that's fine. So then you would want to try and do the vehicle maneuvers first. Now, in terms of tachyarrhythmias, there's always things you need to assess, okay, for any arrhythmia management. You always want to obviously check the heart rate, confirm this with a 12 lead ECG, not just a kind of three lead one. And you want to check for, as I said before, any sequelae as a result of this decreased kind of output. So you're looking for heart failure, you're looking for shock, you're looking for ischemia. Because remember, the heart is a muscle. So if you're pushing it like this, is there pain? Now, in terms of the types of tachyarrhythmia, we have AV nord, we call tachycardias, AVRTs, and macro. You don't need to worry about the macro. But the main thing is if it's, an, if it's a re entrant tachycardia for the AV nord, then the main thing we're thinking about there is kind of a Wolf Parkinson White. And you may see this classical delta wave that, is, that you've probably heard about. Um, and that will have issues because there are certain drugs that you can't use because they work on the AV node and therefore what you'll do is actually uh, paradoxically make things worse because if you're blocking that now um, then you're going to increase the amount of conduction through the abnormal pathway and that can lead to the entrant problems and problems going to VF and things. But the important thing is about keeping it cool and seeing what you can do first. So if the hemodynamically stable said we want to do vehicle maneuvers now, a good one is always a valsalva, and the easiest way to do that is give somebody a syringe, turn it, turn it upside down, and ask them to blow out to push the plunger out. That's a good way of doing it. Um, the modified valsalva is slightly different, but basically achieves the same kind of effect. Now, a good one as well is the clotted massage, which you kind of want to do from the angle of the jaw, midpoint of the angle of the jaw, um, to the actual to the submandibular point, so you want to do it around here, and you want to rub gently, but firmly, but uh, to the point where, if you imagine you were trying to kind of indent a tennis ball, and you want to rub this um, only on one side. You do see people trying to do it on both sides, which is not a good idea. Um, but you're trying to get basically, obviously, stimulate the clotted body, and in doing so, um, you know, uh, actually slow down the heartbeat. And a good one as well is cold water. So a lot of cardiology patients are told if you feel that your heart's going very fast. And you feel like you're going into that rhythm to do that because there's obviously the cold receptor reflex which can mediate heartbeat. Now, treatments I include kind of adenosine. Now, adenosine um, is very, very good, but it's even more, it's very, very fleeting. So you need a very wide bulk candle to give adenosine, and you need to warn the patient it is mightily uncomfortable. And obviously, the body naturally produces adenosine in natural coronaries, which allows for vasodilation. So we're just basically trying to enhance that. Um, and the important thing is when you give this is that you give this with an almighty huge bolus of saline immediately afterwards. Otherwise, it will already be metabolized in the bloodstream and won't have got to the place it needs to, i.e. the heart. 
Um, now, the only real contraindications for IV adenosine, you would probably say is kind of asthma, um, so because it can make things much worse and they will get um, kind of acute attack. So you do need to be careful on that picture. Um, other treatments, if they failed, you know, so you will escalate the doses of adenosine. So you start them on the dose and then you'll increase. You can go up to kind of 20 milligrams, but then you would want to give kind of after three, maybe uh, some Verapamil, which is a, a calcium channel blocker, um, which works predominantly on the heart. Um, now, if that's by the point that you're reaching this, you should really be thinking about getting cardiology involved and things. Um, and this is where the difficulty rises. So, uh, if those have failed, then you really, or if you're reaching that point, uh, multiple doses of adenosine, you really want to think about cardioversion. Uh, in which case, like we've said before, then you want to give them sedation because this is mightily it's mightly painful and uncomfortable. Um, so you want to have them in a kind of dissociative state. Now, for cardioversion in both this and bradycardic, um, you know, this is synchronized. So the whole point is, is that if you imagine a, QR, uh, a normal kind of QRS cycle, so if you see the kind of ECG trace on the top here, you want to give it just after the kind of, um, you want to give the impulse so that it's timed so that it doesn't occur during the repolarizing phase of the ventricles. Um, if you were to do that, um, then actual, the risk is that you are going to produce um, the, um, ventricular fibrillation whilst you're in the refractory period trying to give an impulse. So that's why we give it synchronized. So it's low energy, but timed in the cycle to prevent a kind of VMP. Um, and the one thing to remember is obviously to look at the kind of ECG carefully um, for any kind of Wolf's Parkinson white, because this can present um, in atrial fibrillation and can present uh, with kind of atypical chest pains that are misdiagnosed in this cohort. And so, um, and the risk is if you use things that block the kind of um, AV mode, so that include things, calcium channel blockers, including things like digoxin, then actually you can make things worse. But if they're hemodynamically unstable, then obviously ATV approach, you're giving them, you might give them some fluid support, but what you want to do is cardioverse them. Um, and uh, you will learn about that with your kind of ALS uh, and things. Let's move on to the next one. Um, so somebody said asthma, would you use, would you just use Veropamil? Um, you, it, it depends on the severity of asthma. I wouldn't use in adenosine, you have to take seriously. Veropamil can be used, yes. You could, I wouldn't just use it, no. It's more of a, an approach. If somebody's got life-threatening asthma, I certainly wouldn't touch them with adenosine. If they've had childhood asthma, for instance, and they've not, they don't take anything, you could try it. You don't. You don't. Okay, so this one's a bit more clear cut. People are giving all sorts of, it seems a third have gone for giving the 3% saline. Um, two of them have gone for one litre of normal saline or an hour, some more fluid restriction, and nobody's using Tolvaptan. So the key thing here is this patient is symptomatic, so this should already concern you. She's coming with a low GCS, she's confused, um, and she's had a seizure. So this is all very much from symptomatic hyponatremia. 
Um, and, and I would, well, we'll discuss about other symptoms of hyponatremia, but this is very important. So the sodium here is 119, but we can't leave that. Now, there are people um, who do kind of live and survive on very low um, sodiums, and that's because they've had actually the kind of osmocytes and osmo osmolarities have been calibrated over long periods of time so that they can live with that. But this is acute, and you could tell that from the presentation. So here, actually, the right answer would be A, about giving um, high dose saline. But as you notice, we give very, very small volumes, and we um, relatively quickly, but very small volumes, and we will want to check the sodium. Now, the important thing for these patients is understanding hyponatremia, which um, is not done brilliantly, um, I'll be honest. So the key thing is, whenever you get somebody with hyponatremia, is that you need to clinically assess the patient. Don't, you know, look at the number, yes, but what you want to do is look at their fluid status to determine what the likely cause is. Um, and the fluid status is going to give you a lot of the um, answers of what to do next and what to investigate them for. Now, obviously, there are different grades with the severity of hyponatremia. So if you've got over kind of 130, um, I'll be honest, in my daily, daily kind of practice, that wouldn't raise much of an eyebrow at all. Um, and it's likely to be asymptomatic. You will notice then as you start going less than 130, and usually the cutoff is kind of 125 where you'll get actual um, proper symptoms, but you will start you'll normally begin with nausea and vomiting, followed by slight kind of confusion and disorientation. Um, and then it will progress to actual unusual neurology and um, global headaches, you know, myalgias um, and paresthesias, for instance. So when you're working out the kind of osmolarity and things, you can always, you know, you see people saying, I'm going to send off serum osmolarity because they've got their sodium. You can work that out yourself, it's quite easy. And that's the formula. So you two times the sodium plus potassium, glucose, and urea. The straight away, then that can give you a kind of picture. So we know that the roughly the osmolarity should be about 285 milliosmoles per kilo. Um, and we take paired. So we can what we want to do is compare how much solute is being excreted in the urine versus that of the plasma. And remember, they should be like for like. So if one is low, the other should be low. If one is high, the other should be high. Um, because that should be the normal body response. And when they're discordant, that can obviously give you a picture of possible diagnoses such as SIDH. So for those who are hypovolemic, um, so they've got you know, a very uh, large fluid status, they're obviously fluid overloaded, then you're looking at all the failures, so the causes of kind of transudated effusions around the body, um, so aka CKD, nephrotic syndrome, liver heart failure. If they're euvolemic, and euvolemic just means, um, you know, you could be euvolemic or very slightly hypervolemic. That means, you know, there's no overt, um, you know, fluid up to the knee. But they might have just tiny bits on the ankles, for instance, or, you know, generally, most, you know, and generally fine on the fluid assessment. Now, a fluid assessment, please don't just follow on the um, on moist mucous membranes. Mucous membranes are a very poor sign of global hydration. You know, you should be looking at central and capillary refill time, skin turgor, which is actually unfortunately not very well used um, amongst doctors as a, as a good sign. Uh, and obviously, you know, other, other markers so you can, for instance, infer by the urea, infer by possibly pulses, blood pressure, whatever you want. So for those that are euvolemic, the key things you want to think of are hypothyroidism, because that will affect your glucocorticoid metabolism. Um, glucocorticoid deficiency, so Addison's is a very good one that can cause this, and you'd be remiss to miss that. So looking for you know, patients who come in with tummy pain, nausea, vomiting, low sodium, but relatively normal, more potassium, uh, recurrent admissions, and might have a family history of autoimmune disease. Um, SIDH, so the syndrome with inappropriate ADH release, of which there are numerous causes, but this is where you should be suspicious, where you have um, an osmolality that is low in the serum, so I, the, it's less than 280 milliosmol, which means that they've got more water than solids, so diluting, but yet they're producing concentrated urine, which doesn't make sense because it should be like for like. So if they've got dilute plasma, they should be producing dilute urine. Straight away, that should be making you think of possible hyponatremia uh, of um, SADH, particularly if the urine sodium is high. So if it's over 40 millimoles in that context, you can confidently say this is SIDH. 
Potomania is something called beer potomania, which is um, something which uh, people forget. But if you have actually huge amounts of alcohol intake, um, well, and you often find alcoholics will not eat because they get the calories from drinking, then basically you can wash away your medullary um, gradient, which is obviously used at places where they leak the penalty, um, to allow for water reabsorption and for salt reabsorption, um, as we remember. Uh, in your kind of ascending limb um, and descending limbs. So um, in those instances, what you get is because you don't have salts, because you're not eating a normal diet, you're just drinking beer, you will find that they can't reabsorb salts and things. Uh, and so as a result, they get hyponatremia, but they're relatively easily. And you see this with kind of alcoholics. In terms of those who are hypovolemic, then the key thing is looking at the urine sodium. So if you look at someone and they're dry, look at the urine sodium, if the urine sodium is high, then you know that this is likely from the kidneys. Yeah, so the kidneys are more leaky. They should be taking it on and reabsorbing it, but they're not. And so diuretics are possibly the leading things. Ketones also, because of their osmotic effect, and rarely aldosterone deficiency, but majority of them will be because they're on diuretics. So cutting them down can help. And if the urine sodium is less than 20, so it's relatively normal, then you should be thinking of extra renal losses. So vomiting, diarrhea, um, and even pancreatitis, but you would expect to see that in a constellation of symptoms. Now, in terms of how you go to treat this, the treatment depends if they're acute or chronic hyponatremia, and we determine that by the duration of the hyponatremia. So if it's oh, less than 48 hours, that they've had this precipitous drop, then we call that acute, if it's chronic, it's over 48. Now, sometimes you'll see patients and they haven't had a blood test for two months, so you don't know if it's acute or chronic. But that's why seeing the symptoms in the context is important. So if you see this lady, she had a sodium of 119. Um, she's acutely coming in with seizure and things. She's showing signs of being acutely unwell and signs compatible with hyponatremia. So you would treat this as acute. So obviously you want to try and correct and identify the cause. And when you're trying to, to do this, for somebody who's symptomatic like this, i.e. with neurological screen, you would want to give them, as we said, 150 minimums, 3%. Now, you should not, as F1s, be giving that without your registrar or um, guiding, uh, guiding that. And they should really be in a kind of ITU setting, or at least a HDU setting. Um, the main thing that you have to remember is when you're trying to increase the sodium, you want to do it in a controlled manner. So over the first kind of um, 24 hours, you don't want it to increase more than sort of 10 to 12 millimoles. Um, and the reason is of this is obviously by changing um, the osmolalities, um, you could very well um, inflict and cause uh, problems with kind of pontine demyelination and things. So you want to do it in a controlled manner. So with these patients, you want to be rechecking um, their use and ease. So you'd like to be at least BD. Uh, you want to be checking neurology. Uh, and I remember having to do this as an F1 over an uncle weekend, and, which was which was fun, um, but it is important. Now, in those instances where it's hypovolemic, then obviously you're going to give, um, uh, but it wasn't severe, like we said, then you would want to give things like IV saline, once again, monitoring for these side effects. Um, but if they're normal volemic, then the first thing you want to do is fluid restrict. Now, People will give different limits. I usually kind of say a litre, not a litre and a half. A litre is quite easy to do because in hospital, sometimes you know, mostly the jugs are kind of one litre, so you can say you can have one jug a day. Um, and you would want to check, as I said, the thyroid function tests and cortisol just to make sure that they're normal. Um, as you may want to do further tests thereafter, um, including the synactin, obviously. But in terms of actual treatments, democlocycline is not something used. That's actually an old antibiotic um, that will work um, by blocking kind of um, ADH release. But we can use the Vactans. So tall Vactan things is, is very good for this purpose, but it is expensive. Um, and so it's not often given license, which is it's not often prescribed, which is why we only use it for resistant cases. Um, in, interestingly, it's also used for patients with polycystic kidney disease um, to prevent further cystic growth. But that's kind of a broad management of hyponatremia. Move on.
Okay, so, or yeah, so what have you done? Doing very well. So yeah, sudden onset shortness of breath, chest pain, you've wheeled a saddle P. So a saddle P just means that it's extending into both pulmonary arteries. And this is um, always severe. Um, although you'd be amazed how many patients, so when I say severe, always severe in how it's in that we are very concerned with these patients, but sometimes patients can be surprisingly well with this. Um, and the key thing here is that the patient's hypoxic, yet yeah, we would expect that with a P, but the systolic blood pressure is now falling. So in this context, um, yes, you would want to give IV thrombolysis. Now, P is something that you're going to be dealing with often. Is it P? Is it not P? But remember, pulmonary embolus is not just about thrombus. It's any occlusion of the pulmonary arteries, uh, of the pulmonary vasculature. So um, it can be fat emboli, it can be, which is often missed. So if somebody's had surgery or a recent, for instance, traffic accident, um, something that is often missed is the idea of a fat embolus, which you can always tell what well, you can be suspicious of, particularly if they've got mesonophilia in their blood count and they've got concern type of bleeding and things like that. Um, but also could be, for instance, amniotic fluid embolism. Now, the major risk factors always are um, recent surgery, and particularly we're looking at orthopedic surgery for the neck of femur fractures and those kind of things. Very high risk. Um, and obviously, if there's a family history of DVT, and you should always be suspicious in young people of any uh, kind of thrombophilic disorders, of which obviously factor V leading mutation antithrombin deficiency are predominant, but as well as things such as lupus, which can obviously masquerade in young people. Now, in terms of determining risk, um, we use the well score, and the well score is shown there on the bottom left, uh, bottom right, sorry. And it's about weighing up the constellation of symptoms. Now, here it's pretty clear what's going on, but sometimes you will find quite erroneous use of the D-dimer to try and prove that there might be a PE. Now, remember that the whole point of the D-dimer is not there to inform that there's a DVT, D, uh, DVT is help to, or a PE is there to help you to effectively rule out because of its high negative predictive value. So there's a constellation of things, but in this context, we've got um, signs of the as shown CT. So the CT scan that you'll see, and that, that kind of mid slice is a good example of a saddle P, and the black bit that you can see there shows in an otherwise very good pacified uh, pulmonary trunk, shows a saddle P, so that's how a saddle P looks. And the chest x-ray on your right is an unusual sign that you may see in somebody who you might say has, um, who you would say has a P. Now, chest x-ray findings of P are very poor. This is what we call a Hampton's hump, um, and this is a good sign of that. Um, this kind of wedge-shaped opacity, which doesn't follow the usual kind of, um, uh, well, yeah, which follows the kind of lung markings, as it were. Um, but otherwise, you can get what's called peripheral oligemia. So the fact on the X-ray you can't see vessels going towards the side, or going towards the periphery in one little patch. But they're very low sensitivities. Um, so the main crux is the constellation of symptoms, which will include things such as local fever. Now, massive PE is determined by there being an actual drop in systemic blood pressure. And it has to be for more than 15 minutes, and it can't be attributed to any other cause. So for instance, if they're septic, but you think they also have a P, and then they develop that, you wouldn't call that a massive P. Um, and then also we would continue, we would say that people have massive P if they're pulseless, less, uh, pulselessness. So this would be a kind of PA arrest. So that would be a su suggestion in clinical context or any profound bradycardia. Now, things that can make you think about how to, to think about your causes um, include looking at the AA gradient. Um, and then, the AA gradient is looking at the difference in the um, oxygen concentration between the alveoli, so i.e. what's going in into the lungs, and then what is being transferred into the actual ar arteries. So if you've, um, so I've just shown how you would work that out, but the point is, if you've got a normal um, AA gradient, i.e. the difference between the oxygen in the alveoli and the, dif uh, and the difference between that and that which gets into the artery, if that's a normal gap, then usually it's because you're probably de you're having decreased FiO2, so you're, you're taking a lower partial pressure of oxygen. But if the, um, our, if the AA gradient is raised, so I, I've got lots of oxygen in the alveoli, but very little going through, then the main things you need to think about are kind of VQ mismatch. So 
So that could be um, obviously in this instance, such as PE, or you would think of shunts, so maybe right to left shunts that might be cardiac. So you're mixing your kind of deoxygenated blood with oxygenated blood, which would cause that kind of, um, that kind of gap to be present. Now, in terms of management, um, you know, you'll often see people say, well, um, well, what, you know, what are the, you will see what should we do, for instance, with people who are pregnant, or what should we do for these patients? Well, if you always want to look at a kind of bleeding risk, um, so obviously with thrombolysis, main bleeding risk is that they had, for instance, major surgery in the last few weeks, any signs of active bleeding, including gastrointestinal bleeding last month, any previous hemorrhagic strokes, these are extreme contraindications um, for you to give that, uh, to give the thrombolysis. If they're on oral anticoagulation, that's not necessarily one. So I wouldn't say that you know you can't give it, but you do see, and increasingly there is a move towards giving as well in, in intermediate patients kind of half dose thrombolysis as well. Um, and I would just also say that obviously PE can um, present in a myriad of ways, such as new AF, um, but also um, kind of new heart failure. So looking particularly for right-sided heart failure signs and new right bundle branch is important. Now, in pregnancy, people often say, well, we're going to have to do a VQ scan. Um, unfortunately, this depends on the index of suspicion. So generally, CTPAs actually offer very little radiation to the child. However, they do have an increased cancer risk going up towards um, I believe it's the age of around 30. Um, but the actual additional risk is very, very small. Um, the main thing is then the risk of breast cancer to the actual um, lady herself, to the mother. So these things need to be balanced. But generally, if you've got somebody with a normal chest X-ray, then in those instances, a VQ scan ha actually has a reasonable sensitivity. Uh, and can be good enough to diagnose, although the radiation from that is not insignificant in and of itself. If somebody's got an abnormal chest X-ray and you're thinking that they've got that, uh, got a PE, then actually a CTPA can be mightily helpful um, in determining um, whether there is actual superadded PE, just because there will be VQ mismatch because of perhaps a pneumonia or some other process that you've identified, or if they've got pre-existing lung issues. So in terms of treatment, you are going to give them, um, you know, heparin um, in, to, to treat these patients. And you, you need to think after giving them thrombolysis, you know, which would be kind of, you know, your TPA kind of activating things, you, you need to be looking for kind of HIT, so heparin induced thrombocytopenia, um, as this is a risk of something that may, that may develop kind of five to seven days after starting therapy. And even if you think that in like a young person like this, um, if you think that there's a thrombophilic disorder, send those blood tests before you start the actual um, uh, kind of warfarin or kind of low molecular weight heparin, um, just because it will muddy the waters a little bit. Um, in terms of DOACs, DOACs are increasingly becoming a thing. So actually, um, they are being used now um, in PE setting as initial treatment. Um, but there is really very little trial data in terms of in the setting of massive PE. So you can, you know, there are case reports and things, but it's not really generally done. So you want to give them um, thrombolysis and then you may put them on, and may put them on heparin um, rather than outright giving them both. And then the outcomes really, you can look at going forward. So it's important to remember, um, I mentioned to people that there's a high risk that you'll be um, symptomatic post PE, particularly if it's massive. And as shown here, up to 10% in the first two years um, will still be symptomatic um, and still, um, oh, sorry, that 10% is slightly different, but uh, it's basically up to 30% actually will be symptomatic for several months thereafter. The important thing is remembering the outcome of pulmonary hypertension as a result of having a PE. Um, and this, um, will lead to kind of prolonged breathlessness and issues then going forward, particularly with the development of cold pulmonary. And these patients then can be referred to the pulmonary hypertension clinic and assessment for things such as carotid endoterectomy. And the reasons for all this happening is because of the, the right ventricle is weak compared to the left ventricle. 
So there being a thrombus in the vasculature means that the left, the right ventricles have to work much harder. And because of this, it basically um, over time will remodel um, and become thickened, um, leading to kind of initially increased output from the right ventricle, but eventually can't keep up. So therefore you get right ventricle failure, but also you get remodeling of the pulmonary vas vasculature where it becomes thickened. And as a result, this leads to the kind of increased blood, increased pressure there, which you then struggle to modulate. Let's move on to the next one. Oh, um, somebody's asked the dosage of heparin. You, there's no, um, the dosage of heparin after P that needs to be weight based. So you're going to be looking at that. Okay, so which of the following is the most likely? And it seems a lot of people are going for C. Um, so out of these things, I think the big clues here is severe sudden onset chest pain. Um, as soon as you're getting that with a rather brisk flaccid paralysis, you should be thinking straight away of B, aortic dissection, um, rather than um, kind of ischemic stroke i mean it's not it's not i mean unless you've formed a ventricular kind of a ventricular thrombus which is then embolized but it wouldn't cause um flaccid paraparesis because obviously this is symmetrical so that can be another hint as well now in terms of aortic dissection remember this is life-threatening um at least 20 percent will die before they even reach the hospital it's more common in males, um, and the major risk factors are hypertension, um, smoking, cardiovascular disease, and obviously those patients with any sort of connective tissue disorders, so your Marfan's, um, particularly your Ehlers-Danlos, um, Pseudovansoma, Elasticum, these kind of patients. And we classify aortic dissections um, according to whether affecting. So the easiest I find is the Stanford A, Stanford B, so if it's kind of ascending um, aorta, it's kind of um, type A, um, and then type B is if it's going into the descending after the arch of the aorta. I should add actually that the protective feature for aortic dissection, um, uh, one of them is considered uh, kind of diabetes, so I'll just put that out there. But the key things that you should think of with aortic dissection is sudden onset chest pain, obviously that classical radiating to the back, tearing in nature, and um, the fact that there's a new aortic reboot murmur. And that is because there's been that tear, you form this kind of internal flap. And so the blood is actually circumventing baby valve, causing this um, classical change then with aortic regurg. Another hint that you can also get is you, you will also develop MI features on an ECG because um, in the ascending aorta is obviously where you get the coronary um, arteries coming off, and so you typically develop MI features on there, which should be highly suggestive based on this. Now, the chest x ray below is quite classical for aortic dissection, but you'll see this in only a subset. Um, and that is the fact that this patient has mediastinal um, dilation, dilatation, so it's a very widened mediastinum, particularly at the top here where you're seeing the aortic knuckle. Um, so this is quite very wide. And then also this classical left effusion. So if you see this kind of context, it should be um, kind of suspicious. 
um, particularly with this history. Now, in terms of investigations, you might want to do an ECG because, as I said, they may have a, they may very well have ischemic changes in their MI, but actually that can be normal and up to 20%. And things such as bedside echo can be really helpful here um, to ascertain if there is an actual tear. And you will see this kind of intimal flap that, run, that runs and flows. Now, we've written MRI there, but actually the main kind of stay is often to treat with, as often, sorry, to image with kind of CTA order to kind of rule this out, because that's something that can be organized quite easily. And um, I would just alert you that there are patients who come in um, with acute and chronic aortic dissection, and chronic means over 14 days. And it's for those ones that you'll typically see are the kind of Stanford B, so the ones involving the des descending aorta. Um, and the treatment will depend basically on what type you've got. So if it's type A, so like this patient sounds like a type A because it's causing aortic regurge, is involved in the aortic guard, predominantly it's going to be surgery that they need there to correct that. Um, if it's those that are type B, so it's moving from the aortic arch to the descending, then this is um, someone that you would want to do medical treatment. And that involves, that may involve surgery in the end, where you might need to put an endovascular repair, but it's often blood pressure control. So you want to use things such as beta blockers, um, and maybe GTN things to try and reduce the blood pressure. Usually it's kind of 100 to 120 systolic. Now, in this instance, this gentleman has lost, as I said, uh, he's got flaps of para, uh, paraparesis. And the reason for that is obviously the aorta gives off the radicular arteries. And one of the important contributions to kind of artery of Adam Kiewitz. So he's getting ischemia of his particularly anterior spinal cord, which is causing these symptoms. Um, so with this, actually, um, unfortunately, the outcomes are not looking great for this gentleman. So surgical management may be will be will be needed early to try and see if um, the myelopathy can be repaired uh, and this could be reversible. Move on to the next. Okay, so it seems split. The majority of you want to give IV lipitalol. Um, some of you sublingual GTN, and some of you then want to give IV GTN. So for this, actually, the right answer would be to give IV GTN. Um, and we'll go through a little bit why. So the first thing here is, is that you'll see lots of people with hypertension. The key thing is to find what the systemic uh, kind of complications are as a result of that. So for instance, do they have hypertensive encephalopathy? Do they have chest pain because of myocardial ischemia and signs of heart failure um, or you know, changes in ECG? Or do they have, for instance, renal nigh disease where they're getting high amounts of blood and protein in the urine as a result of this? So they have you know, lipidity changes. Or do they have changes with vision? So these are the, this is the assessment you need to do for patients when they're coming in like this. You need to check the back of the eyes, look at the papilledema, um, the kind of key coagulant scale, and then you want to be looking um, particularly for urine dip, and you need to be checking for chest pain. Now, because he's coming with chest pain and he's got ST depressions, then the main thing here is that this is hypertensive emergency because he's got systemic end organ damage. So the point with hypertension is acute treatment is very different from chronic treatment. Now, the image on the top kind of right is an excerpt from kind of mice, and that's for chronic um, hypertension. 
I remember a lot of the patients who were going to turn up to your clinic with high blood pressure or like this. Um, they've had hypertension for many years, but it may have just may have got worse. So we can't use that approach. But it's important to remember that those patients who've had hypertension for long term, they've already made, there have been adaptations to their body to deal with high blood pressure. So they often come in less symptomatic. And this is because of your autoregulation um, curve. Excuse me. So as you can see here, um, for normal patients, for instance, with cerebral blood flow, the whole point of autoregulation is the fact that despite differences in mean arterial pressure, that you are able to um, maintain cerebral perfusion pressure of the brain. So for instance, the same curves will exist for, for instance, the kidneys. Now, in people who are chronically hypertensive, we get white shift of the curve. So you'll actually find that for very high blood pressures, um, they're still getting very good flow of the, um, of the organ, not leading to any damage. But that means that if you drop the blood pressure precipitously very quickly, then actually you could very quickly lead them to ischemia, okay? Because they have needed, as we've just said, a higher blood pressure to achieve the same amount of perfusion pressure or flow to that organ. So that is why dropping the blood pressure very quickly is very dangerous. So you can cause strokes, you can cause heart attacks as a result of you dropping the blood pressure, not because the blood pressure was raised in the first place. But in this case, obviously, she's coming symptomatic. Now, in terms of treatment, the decision is, um, you know, what to do. Now, if there's hypertensive urgency, so there's no signs of end organ damage, but for instance, the blood pressure is over 160, then what I would say is you can probably go with oral treatments, that's fine. For this gentleman, you want to give IV treatments because we need to control. Now, the main thing that you need to remember is that we're not trying to get um, a normal blood pressure for these patients. We're trying to reduce the blood pressure by 25% in the first hour and trying to normalize it for the next day or two. All right. So people have put, for instance, uh, about using libitolol. Libitolol is very good and works um, um, relatively quickly, but it's for that uncontrolled nature with the blood pressure drop that is some reason why you wouldn't want to give. In the same reason that esmolol, which you may see in, in, in things as well, esmolol and libitol are very short acting. Esmolol only has for a couple of seconds, I think it's like a minute's half life. So you, and it's as a result of that, you can't just give an injection of these things and leave it. One thing that's very popular here is about giving things within the fedipine. Now, the fedipine modified release works within about maximally within 30, 60, 30 to 60 minutes but people don't appreciate that it lasts in the body for six to eight hours. So you can quickly accrue nephedipine into the system and once again can lead to very, very poor, um, oh, sorry, sorry, very high blood pressure drops um, and therefore can lead to um, acute ACS developing as a result of this. So how are you going to investigate these patients? So that's why we go, sorry, for the GTN because you can do it controlled and you can titrate the dose of GTN as you're giving it for someone like this. Now, in terms of treat, um, things you're going to measure, you're going to measure the use and ease FBC. You're going to check the TFTs just because you're looking for hypothyroidism that's leading to this. Um, the reason I mentioned about blood film is because if you've got extreme malignant hypertension, then you can get, um, you may have heard of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So this is the idea that because you've got such high blood pressure, you're forcing those red blood cells through a very small tube. They start to become shredded. So they form schistocytes. And this will trip the um, actual uh, pathogenic system. So they'll now start to form clots on the actual um, inner side of the arteries. So now you're actually leading to um, a very bad picture. So it's synonymous with things such as hemolytic uremic syndrome and pathophysiology. So blood film looking for schistocytes will be important because this will suggest actually that this is very malignant. All right, so the whole point, learning point from this question is, it's about assessing the complications of the high blood pressure. And then um, if they have got a hypertensive emergency, um, okay, um, bringing it down in a controlled fashion, which will often require IV therapy, but not bringing it down so quickly as to actually cause the complications which you're trying to avoid. All right, let's move on to the next question.
Okay, let's see. We release the poll. Well, I can't see the poll response, but did you release the poll? Oh, can't submit my answer on the poll. Oh, okay. Um, sorry about that. Can somebody just um, can some people just write in the write the answer? Does somebody just put A, A, B? Um, two A's is a B. There's more A's. Okay. So remember, for all of these cases, what's the assessment that we do initially? Can somebody just type it in? A to E, thank you, Ayushi. Um, exactly, so A to E. So the first thing A is that alert. He's not alert, his GCS is eight. Um, so straight away, even in this context, the first thing you should be thinking is we need to get um, anesthetic because it's likely he's obviously been having hematemesis. It's probably off now that from the low blood count and everything else, he's lost his GCS, he's probably swallowed, aspirated, he's probably clogged up his airway with blood. Now, here you've given him hypooxygen, you're gonna need, he needs to be intubated um, at this point, and you've given him IV turdepressin. And for those who don't know, but the whole point of turdepressin is that you're causing splank mix. So blood flow to the gut, you want to cause vasoconstriction. So by doing that, you want to reduce blood flow through the portal system and therefore reduce the actual bleed from these viruses. And you do want to give broad spectrum antibiotics to these patients and as an ID and micro, you know, uh, Reg, I'm never going to complain. You give him tazacin because this is a very useful thing to do. Because with the bleed, you are going to increase um, gut translocation. So these patients are really high risk of gram negative sepsis. So, in this, you want to call the anaesthetist. But for those who've said call the oncology endoscopist, yes, you do. But you want to, before you can do an endoscopy, you need to stabilize the patient. And C is technically correct. You generally do one for H3 over 100 before doing one, but this is an emergency. He's coming very well, so he will have active, um, active uh, transfusions, and he's not reaching the threshold of needing a platelet transfusion at all. Um, now, in terms of upper GI bleed, upper GI bleed um, is very, very common. There's about 50,000 emissions a year from it. And in terms of causes, um, you know, probably peptic ulcer disease is the most common that we see, making up about 30%. Um, another one that's always important to remember are kind of congenital lesions, kind of deolophoise lesions, which are kind of um, normal variations of anatomy, or something called arteries. But also don't forget people um, in terms of malaria rice tears and very common things, so NSAIDs. We see a lot of people who have taken a lot of NSAIDs and then lead to gastric irritation and ulcer and bleed. Now, this patient is obviously presenting with liver disease and varices, which are pop. And variceal bleed is incredibly severe. And half of these patients will, will die as a result uh, of this. And if actually you've had a variceal bleed, your long term outlook and prognosis, even if you recover from that, is incredibly poor. The increased variceal bleeds increase SVP and uh, increased kind of well, basically all cause mortality. Now, these patients can present with hematemesis, but they can they can present with syncope. So you always have to look and always remember um, that even if this patient was to present with a lower GI bleed and frank bleeding, you would you would always want to consider is this a fast transit upper GI bleed? Just something to note. Now your aims before doing things is um, you want to transfuse, you want to try and keep the, the hemoglobin course for 100 as you can. Definitely over 80 is the kind of cutoff really for doing an endoscopy, the platelet's over 50, and you want to reverse any coagulopathy that these patients have because of the effects of liver disease. So you want to give them kind of FFP and uh, vitamin K. Now, obviously, before you do these kind of things, you can do obviously scoring matrices, so kind of your, your Rockwell score um, and your Glasgow Blatchford score, which will, which will be done. 
to ascertain the kind of risks going forward of re bleed and, and mortality. Um, and um, obviously, the Blackwood score is there to assess whether or not they need um, endoscopy. Uh, and there's very low threshold because if you score less, you know, over one, then you're going to be uh, needing it. But the Rocco score is very important because it helps differentiate uh, recurrence risk uh, and kind of long term outcome. Um, and you can read there about how to kind of calculate it. So, in terms of the management of um, kind of GI bleeds, obviously it's about um, you want to try and control the bleeding age of the approach, resuscitate them, and perform obviously endoscopy to try and control the bleed if possible. Um, in terms of PPIs, um, your PPIs really should be given kind of after the procedure, before the procedure. You will see people prescribed ibuprofen, but it's not um, um, always the case that actually that will work. So um, if they're for conservative treatment um, and they're not for endoscopy, then yes, you'd want to give them high dose um, PPIs, um, which you give as a bolus initially, and then kind of eight, you know, eight milligrams kind of per hour for the first kind of 72 hours kind of thing. Um, there was talks about using, for instance, uh, TXA, trinitronic acid in this context, and trinitronic acid is now used in lots of different um, areas um, in terms of lower GI bleeds and things, but um, actually there doesn't seem to be any any change in kind of upper GI bleeds in those sort of severe presentations. And remember with variceal bleeds, the main things you want to do is start kind of vasopressins particularly. So using tolopressin is something that you can do that's very, very helpful. Now, vitamin K, you don't need to give it to every patient, but if they've got extreme coagulopathy, yes, you kind of want to. Um, so it's not that you have to just give a cirrhotic patient vitamin K if their PT is 13, for instance, is relatively normal, but you should um, if it is very deranged. Uh, and the same with you know, antibiotics. Actually, you know, if you don't um, give them broad spectrum antibiotics, the high risk of um, uh, bacterial infection thereafter because of the gut translocation of bacteria, but also if they've turned up with um, a bleed, obviously, as we know, bleeding is a high risk for decompensation. They may very well have a cytis, which is also infected, uh, an SPP, so therefore you want to try and treat that and give them therapy. Now, in terms of how they treat, then often for endoscopy, what you will do is um, that you would want to do um, kind of clipping of, of aneurysms and things uh, and adrenaline, so, uh, adrenaline injections around the sites uh, and even um, banding, therefore, of the varices to stop bleeding. And then you would want to probably do a relook endoscopy within kind of um, kind of 48 or 72 hours, depending on the findings, to make sure that that is still stable while you're continuing the kind of omeprazole infusion. For some patients, however, this doesn't work to control the bleeding. Um, and this is where things such as balloon tamponade are often used in these kind of sense taking tubes, um, although they can cause massive issues, but um, most pertinent of which include necrosis of actually um, the esophagus and the stomach because of um, ischemia induced by obviously the extramural pressure. Um, but these patients, yeah, you need to stabilize. You do want the um, endoscopist to be involved, but we need to remember our ATO approach. So for this patient, if you're putting out a met call, you'd be getting the endoscopic scan, you'd be wanting to take routine bloods, FBCs using UCLP, LFTs, a clotting, group and safe, and VDG. Um, and then, as I said, you would want to um, rapidly put in the massive hemorrhage protocol in your hospital, which would be different, um, uh, and get the endoscopic scan. Let's move on. Only two questions left. Um, oh, um, somebody's asked about ulcers and varices. An um, ulcer is just a breach in a mucosa. So that is just an irritation to the lining. And um, so obviously you have gastric ulcers and duodenal. A varice is because of portal hypertension and um, leading to kind of venous dilatation, as it were, which in liver disease patients will occur in particular sites, more often the esophageal veins, the rectal veins, and obviously, um, yeah, and actually in the spastic circulation. Um, so yeah, that's the bit.
Okay, so everyone here wants to start on, uh, a lot of people want to start on carbimazole. So the thing here to recognize is, I, as I said, I'm an IED physician, um, and often you see temperature equates sepsis. I know it doesn't. Um, there's lots of reasons for temperature. And the kind of main cause here is understanding the constellation of symptoms. So she's given very good causes of thyrotoxicosis, even without the thyroid function tests. So here, actually, the, the answer is actually given thyroid uracil, and we'll go into that. So this is a presentation of thyroid storm, and this is extremely life-threatening. And the manifestations of thyroid storm are because of the hypermetabolic state caused by the increased thyroid hormone release. Now, um, in terms of um, its characteristics, you normally will get obviously the tachycardia, the medley in AF, um, and what we call, uh, um, what was I going to say? Um, high output cardiac failure. Um, but um, obviously they will become quite feverish and you can see that they have fever, so it can be in excess of 39 to 40 degrees and they will get CNS changes. So this often they can come up with this euphoric or uh, psychotic manner, but also in stupor or coma. Now, in terms of your kind of um, classical reasons for this, this could be the first presentation, but classically it can be things such as if you've, for instance, been in radio iodine to a patient, and therefore you've caused um, extreme um, thyroid death and release of um, thyroid hormone, or for instance, if you've been playing around with thyroid during surgery. Now, there are different scoring mechanisms to find out um, whether thyroid storm is likely, one of which is a Bush apostrophe score. You don't really need to know about that. The key findings that you may see to support thyroid function, uh, thyroid storm, includes increased white cell count, increased bilirubin, hypoglycemia because of the hypermetabolic state, and hypercalcemia because of the effects that um, thyroid hormone has on osteoclast activity. Now, in terms of um, treating this, then in, there are kind of the five Bs that you want to do. So um, you want to kind of block synthesis, so we give antithyroid drugs. And the reason we use prepothyroidal is because it's actually faster acting than carbamazole. Um, and it also has the added benefit of it affects your deiodinases. So if you remember, you release predominantly T4, and then T4 is broke, is kind of converted to T3 by deiodinases in the peripheral circulation. So preparatory use of works on both the thyroid and the deiodinases to lower. You also want to kind of give iodine, and this is kind of wolf shake off effect, which is that if you actually give somebody exogenous iodine, then as a kind of reverse feedback system, then the body will actually reduce thyroid output and thyroid hormone release. And then you will want to treat further by helping the symptoms with the kind of, uh, as we said, the restlessness, the agitation, the AF by using propanolol, so kind of mixed um, beta uh, antinergic receptor activity and steroids as well, because steroids affect also deiodinases. And um, you can use things such as cholestyramine and things because thyroid hormones are recirculated, um, so that can help with that. Um, but realistically, the whole point of this one is to understand how it presents and understanding that um, you know what you need to be doing to stage approach, thinking about actually the cause. So for this lady, you're trying to block the synthesis, block the release, block the conversion of thyroid hormone and then you're trying to ameliorate the symptoms of these blockers. And these patients will need IV therapy. So the iodine, for instance, will be IV. Um, you kind of, and you would want to give um, IV propanolol during this time. And all of this will be IV propanolol to control this and reverse this. Okay, but this is a very good one. That uh, mixedema crisis, which I would um, implore you to read about, because you do see cases I've seen a few. This is the last question. Oh no. Oh, damn it. Um, okay, really sorry about that. Um, yeah, I didn't mean to, I, I don't know why that one was bold. Okay, can anyone just in the chat, was everyone think, read the question and was everyone thinking that the answer was C? <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> I'll feel, yeah, I'm sorry about that. 
Yeah, so somebody's mentioned about the tinnitus. Yep, that's a good sign. Ha uh ha, -huh, yeah, thanks for your sheeting. <laughs> Great, yeah. So, yeah, we'll just move forward on this because I think a lot of people have seen this one. So the point is looking at them, even if you don't know, it's about looking at the other ones. So codeine, we wouldn't expect it to cause this. We wouldn't expect it to be tachypneic. We would expect it to be, obviously, have a diminished respiratory um, count. Uh, we would expect it to maybe have pinpoint pupils um, and things like that. Same with the diazepam. Ethylene glycol, um, well, this is antifreeze. This is what you find in antifreeze. It's odorless, it's colorless, and it tastes sweet. So you can find some people spiking. But that usually has kind of three phases. There's the kind of CNS phase where you become almost tetanus. Um, and then you get a cardiac phase where you become into heart failure with hypertension and peripheral edema. And then you get renal failure. So it's kind of a three stage approach. Um, and the major kind of signs of renal failure is because you develop crystals because it starts to form oxalic acid, which reacts with calcium. So you get massive, huge calculi that fill the whole system of your kidneys. So here, really, you can break it down. We know it's not paracetamol either because it's well, it's not causing this. So yeah, so this is um, yeah, you will get the slides. Um, I'm sure. So this is aspirin overdose and. Um, Aspirin overdose usually has kind of three phases. So obviously you're giving it, um, this is salicylic acid. So this is a cause of kind of high um, anion gap metabolic acidosis. So what we were talking about at the very beginning of the talk. And initially because of this and the acidosis, you directly stimulate the respiratory center. So you get dyspnea as a result. And uh, as a result of the response of this, what you, um, what you then get is um, aciduria, where you try to remove the acid acidemia um, with this metabolic, uh, metabolic um, acidosis. And the kind of mild features that you normally get are the fact that they'll start to feel nauseous, vomiting, and tinnitus is a classic sign alongside kind of dizziness. Your severe kind of um, symptoms are those patients who've had really high doses. So when we say high, we mean a severe overdose would be someone who's had more than kind of 300 milligrams per kilo. So as you can see, far more than we would be talking in terms of kind of the paracetamol. So this you need to eat, have more of this. Um, and those patients then, they could be deaf rather than tinnitus, they'd be hyperreflexic. And they could obviously at this point, um, um, because of the effects on the heart, they have a kind of bounding pulse and CNS symptoms. Now, because of how uh, the absorption is, you know, you will often for people who come in with para, you know, paracetamol overdose, you will always check or salicylate and should always do that you know vice versa but um you can't trust plasma salicylate level just like there's a lag of paracetamol you need to be very careful with this because of the absorption so if somebody's come in with kind of 60 minutes um then you you know using charcoal is actually very sensible to use ng charcoal to try and help with this um and um you would want you know there's a kind of two hour lag as i said with the plasma salicylate level so you want to you know, treat preemptively because of the symptoms. So the main kind of way is urinary alkalinization. Um, and that's the point of if you give them lots of bicarb and you turn the alkali, uh, turn the urine alkali, not only will you, um, uh, you'll basically increase the amount that's excreted of the acid, um, because when it's metabolized, it goes into the kidney. Because of that, it will basically move across into the, uh, into the tubules and therefore can be excreted. So you need to check that the pH is between 7.5 and 8.5. Um, so that's, and that's generally how it does. And you do that by giving them high sodium bicarb. So normally, um, you know, and this is the only time you really give high dose sodium bicarb, except for if they've got like tricyclic acid, um, uh, which are overdoses. So you give them 8.4% sodium bicarb um, to maintain that. Now, dialysis is an option, but you should only really give those patients if they've got signs of congestive heart failure or if they're getting coronary convulsions. That's when they have really high levels, and that's what you want to do. You want to try and clear it from the blood. So this is always a good question that comes up in terms of indications for dialysis. Don't forget poisoning, um, because that's a very good one. This, for instance, lithium is a classic one as well. Um, yeah, so this is a classic one. So all of you, well done. Um, you did really well. Here's some links and things to different Fusioners apps, and obviously it's very, very helpful at all stages of medical learning. 
And if there's any questions, you can obviously ask now, or there's my email. Uh, people always email about questions. So feel free to email me and ask away. Um, somebody asked the question with high DP with IV libitol. So um, as I was kind of saying, the libitol, you will see this, and IV libitol is pretty famous within um, um, obviously the pregnant population because obviously it's not teratogenic, it doesn't cross over to affect the, the baby, so it's often used um, for uh, preeclampsia and eclampsia management. Um, so you can use IV libitol. It's a bit tricky to to kind of um, to give and set up. So you will see some centres that prefer to give that, but GTN is actually very titratable. Um, and as I said, it's about controlling um, the amount of blood pressure drop, because as I said, what you want to avoid is actually causing, you know, complications, because now you've decreased the perfusion pressure of whether it be the brain or the, the kidneys or the heart. So it has to be a balance. So GTN um, is a very good way of doing that. And that I've given on the water before, but usually has to be given in H2 setting. The most important thing is for you to ascertain, are they symptomatic? If there's not hypertensive emergency and they don't have organ dysfunction from the ways that we've mentioned, then you can actually think about using oral therapies and then these down. Um, but if they, you know, if they just, uh, uh, if they are symptomatic and you need IV therapy, then GTN is a very good way of doing that. Although in some instances you will use IV um, Yeah. Um, can you put those links in the chat, please? Um, I don't know if my, I think my host will be sending them around later. Is that right? Can you, I think she's sending, yeah. Anyone got any questions about things that you can 